Okay, welcome everybody to this event uh, in or on SPI 25. Um, this is part of the closing event of um, uh, Data Active. Uh, Data Active was a five years uh, research project funded by the European Research Council. And um, for the past uh, two days, uh, we have celebrated the closure um, of this project. Uh, by looking back to uh, the things we studied, the things we would like to study in the future, uh, and also to, um, to reflect upon the collaborations that uh, came out of this uh, project. So um, um, the, 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 the title of our event is Art as Data Activism. Uh, let me first explain you a little bit what the research project was about. So. Um, Data Active um, was a research, or well, we still working on it uh, in spirit. Um, a <laughs> Data Active is a research project uh, that looks at citizen responses to big data. So uh, it was written in the context of the Snowden revelations in which there was a lot of public debate about mass data collection. And there was also a lot of, um, well, both concerns and questions about how citizens would respond. Data Active aims to investigate these responses to um, mass data collection and datafication. So the phenomena that all our behaviors, um, different aspects of social lives are being captured by data and digital data in particular. Um, so, in the project, we uh, cover uh, different aspects of this um, of, of the responses. So people might protect their data. People might also engage with data collection. And also uh, responses can be mixed. And um, what we what we did in the workshop of yesterday was discuss what what were the topics that we investigated. Um, Topics relate ranging from security to um, data investigations, uh, the challenges that we encountered as researchers, uh, and the future research trajectories that we imagine. Um, what we do today is discuss artists' responses to datafication. So, what are possible artistic approaches to the concerns around datafication? How do artists engage themselves with the politics of data? What we have today for you is three presentations. We invited um, a researcher artist Manu Lux. Um, we invited the Internet Teapot Design Studio, represented by Carla Zavala and Adrian Oldenzaal. And uh, we invited Viola van Alphen, who is creative director and curator of Manifestations, to talk about these questions, right? to talk about what are artistic approaches to the politics of data. And I will introduce the speakers in more detail later on. And what I would like to do in particular in this, uh, in this event today is delving a bit deeper into the methods and approaches that our speakers have developed. So for the people that attended also the workshop yesterday, um, uh, the speakers of today uh, presented already uh, a part of their work. And uh, today we have a bit more time uh, to to uh, to watch uh, to 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 uh, to watch what they what they have done, but also to discuss uh, their work. And um, um, at the Data Active project, we have we have of course interviewed many people about their responses to datafication, and we we focused also a lot on um, what you could call organized civil society, so people that take part in NGOs or volunteer and activist networks. And um, artists also take part in these networks. Um, however, artworks are not necessarily the core work of such civil society organizations. And, and today, uh, we would like to uh, stage these artistic responses uh, a bit more so we can make time to discuss also the insights of art artistic responses and, and also the, the questions that creative approaches may um, may raise. Um, after the presentations, there is a, there's a short discussion between the speakers and me, and also maybe the speakers have comments on one another. 
Um, and, and after that, we'll make sure that there's plenty of um, uh, a time uh, to discuss questions uh, from the public in the Q&A. All right. Um, let me introduce uh, to you the first uh, um, uh, uh, presentation, the first speakers, because they are a team. So um, we will start with uh, Carla Zavala and Adrian Oldenzaal. And they together formed the Internet Teapot Design Studio. Uh, this is a Rotterdam-based collaboration that focuses on speculative and critical design projects and research. Uh, Carla Zavala is a, design, uh, a designer and a digital uh, project manager from Peru. And she's specializing in user experience, quality, quality assurance, and communications. And she holds a BA in communication for um, social development at the University of Lima and she has an MA in media arts cultures from Aalborg University and Adrian Oldenzaal is a multimedia designer and web developer from South Africa. He holds a BA in visual studies and sociology from Stellenbosch University and is a recent MA in media arts cultures uh, from Aalborg University and uh, I would like to invite them to uh, to start presenting. Good afternoon, everyone. We are starting to share our screen. So hold, bear with us a moment. I think we are now sharing. So first of all, thank you very much to Data Active Project for the invitation and space to share a little bit more about our work on algorithmic literacy. Um, I am Carla Zavala from Peru. And, and I'm uh, Adrian Moreno from South Africa. And together, as Lonenke introduced us, we form Internet Teapot. We are a design duo based in Rotterdam. And today we are going to talk a little bit more about our ongoing project, Algorithms of Late Capitalism. So um, the project Algorithms for Late Capitalism really started first as a Tumblr blog and an Instagram page where we would curate uh, tech news, memes, and some internet found images that reflect some of the absurdities uh, of digital technology and how it is shaped by global market forces. Um, and this for us really touched on this idea of digital materiality that argues that uh, technologies, um, especially these things that are very ephemeral, um, like big data and algorithms, um, have really uh, material outputs in the world and cannot be divorced from the conditions under which they are produced, distributed and used. We eventually turned the project into a series of cinco creation workshops. So far, we have hosted five of them. The goal is that participants collaboratively create one issue of the scene per workshop. I think it is important to mention that the ethos behind sign making is that it provides a space for counterculture discourse and an opportunity for creative self-expression, activism, as well as community connection and collaboration. Um, but so for us, the aim of these workshops are not really to produce this uh, zine in the end, but it's rather about participants um, engaging more critically with software systems in their daily lives um, and to develop a sort of uh, algorithmic literacy. So we define this as um, you know, becoming more aware of critical towards and knowledgeable about how, when, and to what ends ubiquitous data collection practices and algorithmic systems impact our lives. During the workshops, we uh, usually give this theoret theoretical framing um, for the zine discussing topics such as digital citizenry, surveillance capitalism, or digital feminism. And this then becomes the editorial um, according to which they have to do uh, contributions. So for the workshops, we have developed what we call action cards. Uh, these are creative prompts or pathways for participants to start creating uh, contributions, whether it's uh, a drawing or illustration or a narrative or a poem or something. Uh, and we found that these lead participants to engage with highly technical issues um, by weaving theoretical and technical insights into the activities themselves, so that it doesn't really feel that instructional or pedagogical, but rather as part of the creative exercise. So um, I think the one you can see now is this uh, activity of doing a dot visualization of your uh, daily interactions with software systems by thinking really about how data processes um, 
are uh, sub submitted to algorithmic logics and then how that is actually in operation um, with the software that you use. So the group that did this page, uh, they did like a really cool metro map that showed how um, they kind of use apps and software and how these intersect. And then that the stations on this metro really becomes these points of personal data transference between systems. So, you know, you might be watching uh, Mad Men on, uh, I, don't, I don't know, Netflix or something, and then you go to the bathroom and you Google something that you saw on the show or something like that. Um, now, other examples include uh, activities such as writing a diary entry from the perspective of a biased uh, machine vision system. And then we give them these kind of prompts of um, how to think in terms of data inputs, the black box processing, and then the real world outputs. Here is another example. I think uh, it is important to mention that our workshops aim to provide a general picture of how data practices and processing sometimes don't make sense. Uh, throughout this project, uh, we have learned that complex topics do not necessarily need to be explained in complex words. On the contrary, these creative exercises provide a space to develop in a group a critical stance towards technology, its logics, and the data gathering and processing practices. So a big part of our approach is uh, born from this idea that conversations about technology um, especially things like big data and, and uh, algorithmic systems often have like a very high barrier of entry. So non-experts are often excluded or don't feel confident to partake um, in these discussions about how digital technologies are designed, developed and deployed in the public sphere. So our aim is really to promote a kind of a, a public algorithmic literacy. Um, and we, we want to do this by engaging a, a, as wide an audience as possible, as wide a community as possible, by using these low barrier mediums like zine making. Uh, we try to do this in a very fun and playful way so that the content uh, is not that instructional or intimidating. And then very importantly, we try to create these dialogical spaces that are open to multiple perspectives and voices. Um, often we do this through creating these co-creation processes. Our current project is to co-create uh, the algorithms of late capitalism, the board game. And this is going to be done over a course of five to six workshops. We have had uh, held two already, where we aim to create a complete board game together with a group of participants. And I think uh, here is uh, some um, of the canvases we have been using so far. Uh, the workshop uh, uh, it works like a relay race. So participants inherit the knowledge created by the previous workshop participants and build on the top of that uh, through adding their own experiences, knowledge and insights. I think um, the, what we wanted to do in our underlying approach is to foster algorithmic literacy in participants and create spaces and opportunities for audience with different perspectives to engage in discussions about digital technologies. So maybe just to kind of like end up um, and, and summarize our approach. Um, so what, what we've really learned through our work um, and wanted to share today is that um, by creating these spaces for playfulness and creative expression, uh, people often excluded from these discussions can become um, more involved and explore topics that are often complex um, related to digital technologies um, and do this in a much more engaged and reflexive way. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. That was great. Um, we will um, quickly move on to our next speaker. Uh, that is Manu Luc. Um, uh, Manu has two decades of experience in researching the effects of emerging technologies on daily life, social relations, urban space, and political structures. Uh, Manu is resident artist at Somerset House, artist in residence at Burbick uh, School of Law, and founding member of, of Ambient TV Net. And um, Manu was formerly an Open Society Fellow in 2018 and visiting fellow at Goldsmiths University of London. So uh, Manu, uh, welcome. Manu, you're, you're muted. 
<laughs> Good point. <laughs> um, yeah, hello again. Thanks for the introduction. And um, thank you, Carla and uh, Adrian, for your presentation. Um, what I would like to share today follows up really nicely on your work around um, making the debate um, of the, the impact and the workings of algorithms more accessible, more easier to understand, like encouraging a wider public really to uh, participate in this discussion since um, uh, the widely experienced uh, impact of algorithmic decision making on our daily lives um, is shaping not just the presence but also the future. So um, I'm going to share a screen uh, in order to um, okay, share sound. Okay. Um, yeah, so if um, just prepared here a few, uh, few slides that um, show how how this um, world that is um, uh, designed and managed and becoming more efficient and convenient, how this is being advertised and described to us. And the question really is, um, you know, how, how do we um, come to our, you know, to, to find our identity, to understand who we are in a, in a world that is constantly massaged in order to respond, what um, you haven't even consciously thought yet, what you, what you might need or want or think. <laughs> so um, this is a slide from a, a smart technology company, but I'm just um, um, quickly going through these examples, like a minority report type of ad uh, from IBM from more than 10 years ago, data helps prevent crime before it happens. And even our most intimate emotional life, um, we are being told is um, yeah, conveniently being helped by these um, algorithms. So um, during the fellowship uh, with Open Society, um, I um, had a chance to delve into uh, this subject matter and um, um, also identified language is one of the starting points to open up this discussion and um, with um, uh, uh, Berlin-based artist uh, Jack Wolf, I uh, devised um, also a series of um, workshops or conversations, if you like, called um, uh, the, the jargon analytics conversations. Uh, run following an algorithm, so you see the flow chart that led these conversations. Um, <clears throat> um, so we attend the questions relating to the Manu. Terminal. Yes, Manu. Sorry, there is some uh, noise, um, so we we cannot hear you very well. So something oh. is is, mm -hmm. is scrolling over here. the microphone. Okay. This is better. Ah, okay. Mm. Okay. I don't. I don't know what it was, but if you're saying it's better, I will continue. Um, so together with um, Jack Wolf, a Berlin-based artist, I uh, devised a series of um, of uh, conversations that followed strictly and. Um, algorithmic instruction. <laughs> so the participants were invited to uh, identify key questions uh, relating to terminology um, of algorithms. So earlier I showed the flow chart um, that the conversation followed. And, and so the, the terms that we queried, um, some examples were like black box, anonymization, noise, transparency but also promises um, like efficiency, happiness. Um, so do you see the cards and um, the users, uh, the, the participants um, are adding the questions which they brainstorm. And um, 
um, and then following the, uh, the this algorithmic chart, um, these items get discussed and then eventually added to a plugin, a plugin uh, that if you're installing it in your browser, uh, will bring up a pop-up window as soon as the mouse um, um, scrolls over, moves over one of the words that we have discussed. Um, and this word, this terminology will then show the questions that query that word. So happiness is one of the promises of the smart world. And the question where is happiness a stable measure? What if happiness is not engaged with the internet? Mm. So yeah, so it shows the various um, questions um, uh, that came up during these conversations. Mm. And um, this um, research also led to the creation of um, a short film. So I usually quite like to offer to, to develop one tool that allows to, to, to drill deeper into, a sub, into uh, an issue related um, to what, what I'm exploring and at the same time to resort to uh, narratives or storytelling uh, yeah, in order to reframe these questions in, in, a, in a different format. So, Algorithm um, is a short film for which I collaborated with um, rappers and hip hop artists. Mm, and um, the story is um, <clears throat> um, basically based on the observations of um, the impact of fake news, but also um, uh, micro targeting of voters in the run up to political. Um, in the run-up to elections um, and referendums, and, and this was, <coughs> excuse me, and this was before, um, yeah, even before this um, uh, the scandal around Cambridge Analytica a few years ago um, uh, broke and became um, an issue so discussed by the media. So I would like to maybe play a brief excerpt. Um, starting from here. On connaît tout sur tout le monde, ce qu'il cache, ce qu'il montre, les secrets les plus intimes des innocents et des monstres. Pourquoi se limiter au corps quand on peut lire dans les esprits Les gens se confient, se confessent et déballent toute leur vie. Sur les réseaux sociaux, leurs tout nouveaux confidents. Alertes si inoffensifs, compréhensifs et intelligents. Vraie mine d'or de données personnelles et de renseignements. Ah, et sur quoi portent réellement ces renseignements <rire> Sur ce qu'ils mangent, ce qu'ils boivent, leurs rêves, leurs cauchemars, leurs couleurs préférées, leurs croyances, leurs espoirs. Ah, je suis rassuré, alors parlons dans mon programme. Non, c'est sur les émotions qu'on va baser votre campagne. Et pour rendre ce marketing politique possible, tout d'abord on profile, on classifie et puis on cible grâce à nos algorithmes qui calculent et déterminent les tendances et les intentions de vote qui se dessinent. here so uh, so this short film is like one example how um, I'm then framing my uh, findings in um, speculative uh, narrative heavily based on observations and analysis and um, so this film then got translated in into about eight languages and um, has been uh, included in the curriculum at schools across Germany, for example. Um, so, yeah, so as an artist, really, I'm always quite happy if I can, uh, if my work is um, defying the boundaries of the arts ghettos and, um, yeah, reaching um, other outlets than museums and galleries and art collections. 
with this film being one example um, of this combination toolbox uh, and narrative working. And yeah, I look forward to the discussion later. There's so much more to be said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we will get back to this later on in the discussion. Um, I would like to introduce our third um, uh, speaker, uh, Viola van Alphen. Uh, she's an activist, writer, and the creative director and curator of Manifestations, an annual art and tech festival in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, with themes like Will the Future Design Us, e fashion, robots, Internet of Women things superpower to the people, technology as your perfect boyfriend. The festival addresses issues that create controversy and encourage the visitors to be more actively engaged in technology and the role they want technology to have and not to have in the future. Welcome, Viola. Hey, uh, hello. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm Viola van uh, Alfa. I'm the creative director of manifestations and I'm going to share my screen because I think it's always much easier to um, to show things than to just talk about them. Uh, so I see that I'm going to first start with a video clip uh, of this year's manifestations. <laughs> So what you just saw here, and let me look it back. This is like a like an um, baby outfit for mothers with a, with a uh, smartphone addiction. So the baby thinks it gets all the mother's attention while the mother is quickly working on her likes. <laughs> We're fucked. Oh yeah, and um, getting people to think about data and what happens with it and like the downsides because you only see the fun sides. Eh? Google is like not a cute uh, co co company that just likes to give give away things for free, but the user is always the end one who is always paying for it. So yeah, one of the other artists that we showed, Tom Schaal, is visualizing this in a, in a candy machine, as you can see here, and I was so hungry. And you got free skittles when you would share your age or your gender. Ooh, discount, 15 cents, yeah. <laughs> We're definitely fucked. Yeah, so we're definitely fucked. Always nice to know. Here's another trailer. You think? Yeah. You blocked me on Facebook. And now you're going to get fucked up. So we always use like uh, art tech and fun because fun is the element that is yeah that is always uh, helping people to understand things better. Oh yeah, the Dutch Design Week has 350,000 visitors and we are one of the big festivals that week. We are the art and tech uh, festival there and uh, we get about 35,000 visitors uh, offline and more uh, online. Let me think, do I have more pictures for you? Yeah. <laughs> So um, I have a little bit of an overview of some artworks that we showed in the last uh, project. Some of them was here, uh, was data poker, like a real poker table, Roos Groothuis, you had a whole casino actually. And if you lost a round, then you had to like spin this wheel for to see your punishment. And your punishment could be show your last five visited uh, YouTube videos to the, to the other people. And then you'd hope there's no porn in it, or what, but it's not allowed on YouTube. But anyways, there's a lot of gross things to find there. Or to show and share your uh, 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 current uh, bank statements, like how much do you have on a bank? <laughs> and that is that is 
so confronting that when you share it with the table with real people, then you feel it's a little bit better than when you when it's in in the background uh, happening a lot. Uh, this year, because of Corona, we worked a lot with the virtual worlds. The top one is Mozilla Hubs, for instance. The bottom one is, uh, yeah, well, the um, plus side, top side of Mozilla Hubs is that you can run it in a browser. But uh, Second Life and Sansa work a little bit better in a standalone uh, program. And they have a much nicer graphical interface. But artists are always looking for the boundaries. So some artists got uh, kicked off. It's also their task yeah, to look for boundaries. And... Um, so they started their own servers on open grids and open systems. And that is nice. So, so you can always host your own server at home. That's more about power to the people, more like decentralization where I really believe in. And um, yeah, that is what I yeah, what I really uh, want to promote. The, the power to the people topics are really topics that I would like to show to people. And also one of the things that I always do is that I ask artists like which newspaper line yeah, what, with which headline do you want to be in the newspaper? And put that headline on top of your work. Because, you know, even professional visitors that have seen a lot of things, they start thinking really quickly and they don't have a lot of patience. So I really try with simple IMDb kind of one-liner text in the, in the first part of the explanation next to the artworks to make it as easy as possible to for the... Oh, there's a lot of scrolling going on. <laughs> Let me see. All right, this was on the, the, the data poker, for instance. Eh? And uh, this was the, the discount machine, candy machine. This was a machine that you could, could actually, it was a an, um, an dice with buttons. And then you had to find out what each button was doing. So every button did something else, like putting pink uh, dots on the screen or green dots or all other colors or other sizes. And when you figure it out, you're thinking, wow, I've been so occupied with figuring it out that you really don't see that in the end there is a, that, that you get a printout uh, sh showing an analysis of your character, like, hey, you're very perseverant or like not focused at all person type of person. And um, we had a jury every year and they really liked this game because I often look at uh, data um, artworks and sometimes they're really difficult to understand. But And that is sometimes a bit sad because then a lot of people, yeah, a lot of audiences, you, you will uh, immediately lose those uh, audiences. So, but this one was really yeah, easy and the, yeah, you were playing a game and you really didn't know that something else was going on and it was measuring your data and analyzing your characteristics. I have a whole list of things. I'm going, this is about online advertisements. Um, I'm going to scroll bits quickly through it and I'm going to pick out some nice ones for you. Uh, all of them. <laughs> She's looking for one. Uh, oh yeah, this is the AI business card maker. And then it asks you like, hey, uh, what's your name? Type in your name. What color business card do you want? And you say green and it says, what, green? Green, pink is now a really popular color. Choose pink. And then it says, okay, do you want green or pink? And then you could say, no, I want green. And then it says, oh, glad that you chose pink. Good, let's continue to the next step. <laughs> and I heard that was a lot of fun because people recognize it from the computer at home that never always listens to the user. But also you heard people actually scream at the machine. And it was also really fun for, the, for their friends or other uh, visitors of the exhibition standing around it. Because the screaming at the machines is uh, something that you might recognize from your homes. And yeah, we try to have, um, yeah, with as, as, as easy, understandable things here, you could put um, a 3D printed face mask on it. And uh, yeah, this was also visible at the Big Brother Awards, really cool, cool event of Bits of Freedom, by the way. And uh, yeah, everybody was, was invited to put one of these face masks of the artist Leonardo uh, on top of its face, make an Instagram selfie. And then the algorithm of Instagram would be really confused because Leonardo's uh, face is suddenly all over the world. So the reliability of the database of uh, Instagram would, would go back, would go bad, worse. This was about uh, fishing. And you could really like an old man fisher box. You could walk around with an UV black light to find out if you go to facebook.com with the O's were done in the Thai O's, which you cannot see with the visual visible eye, but you could see it with this uh, torch of uh, black light. 
And that is, I think that is the task what artists are doing. They're making difficult, com complex topics that are sometimes a bit boring or that a lot of my friends think, hello, what, why do I care about data or privacy or abuse of this? I have a government to protect me. Well, these are like um, visual appealing um, artworks that really make a really broad audience think about, hey, is this what we want? And now we understand this, uh, this dilemma or this complex topic. Oh, this was uh, one of uh, the, the director of city marketing in Eindhoven was a really big fan of this one. This was about, um, ab about whistleblowing. Like, what would you do if you would be Edward Snowden and you have some data that you want to share with the press, but your government probably doesn't want you to do that? Where would you start? That is a really difficult question. Eh? So the um, asking that question to the audience, yeah, that also yeah, took them on a journey how this artist uh, approached the answer to this question. And it was with a special code that would change the way that you, uh, that you walk. So the, 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 the body position street cameras could not really detect you anymore. And it had um, the legal rights that you have of whistleblowers printed on the inside of the code. And it has a Linux Tails USB stick that you can uh, easily send out emails without le leaving any uh, traces because you can just pull out the USB stick if you are a whistleblower or other. And, and uh, he even had those USB sticks for the people and he used a Faraday cage for, for your phone that he could test out. And that is making things really touchable. And that is one of the success factors of explaining the, um, the discussion about data to people. It has to be fun, but also you have to like um, create some kind of understanding for each other in a normal uh, language. Like another topic, another example for that was that we had... Um, um, that we had a, a, a video last year against the weapon industry, and it was actually showing how many companies, because Eindhoven, that's where we do it, is a tech area of the Netherlands, how many companies were involved in making weapons, and in what way. So some of them were sponsoring the international weapon fairs, and that was really in your face, like, oh, this is... Uh, company X, it's next to the Eindhoven airport or next to the supermarket that you always go to, and they make this. And then I thought, okay, now for sure, we're going to lose all our sponsors. <laughs> and then I asked our sponsors, like, okay, big software companies of Eindhoven, um, are we going to lose you now? Because we really have to do this. Eh? And they said, no, super good that you're not doing self-censorship because um, you have to criticize and, and question the, the ethical sides of technology. We really uh, need that here. So the sponsors didn't walk away at all. So it's really important that you don't do any self-censorship, uh, especially in, in these times of, yeah, where, where also woke is a really uh, important topic nowadays. Um, what did I write down? What else? Oh, yeah. The topics that we had last year, we had uh, in the year before a superpower to the people. And last year it was about monsters that were like parasites of the earth. I think I'm going to speak to the screen again so you can see me. So parasites of the earth and then um that topic of monsters because i thought i'm like cookie monster i would love to eat cookies <laughs> but we're also a little bit with our uh, shopping really fastly depleting all the resources in the earth and um now yeah and they took in the topic of monsters in the, in some of the high-tech campus co company plants And then I asked them, oh, did it work? And they said, no, but, uh, people didn't have time. Can you think of a new topic to help us with that? So the, the, talk, the talking with all these new target audiences is really the, um, yeah, the key of success. That's, that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Viola. Um, so I would like to um, start a discussion um, with you. And um, I would like to actually first ask uh, Carlen and Adrian, uh, so what do teapots have to do with the internet? Because your, your project is called the Teapot Design Studio, Internet Teapot Design Studio. Could you, could you explain a bit more about this? Uh, yeah, what, what, why teapots? Oh, we are so happy with that question. 
Uh, so I think, um, okay, let's start. It is named after the HTTP error. That is, uh, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Uh, the error is the number 418, just as there is 404 page not found that I think everybody in this room has encountered, where uh, there is also a 418 for those who are curious to look for it. So just a little bit of internet history. Uh, here comes the part, historical part. In 1998, uh, there was um, in one April, April's Fool's Joke, the engine, Internet Engineering Task Force um, created this uh, protocol as the Hypertext Coffee Pot Protocol so that they can control, monitor, and diagnose coffee pots on the internet. So I think Adrian can quote the, the error that appears yes. about 14 So it's really started as a, as a April Fool's joke, but it still exists as like a, um, a protocol that you can find on some websites. And the, the error is that um, any attempt to brew coffee with a teapot should result in this error code 418. I'm in a teapot and the resulting entity body may be short and stout. Um, and so we chose this name because um, we really like to think of this idea that, you know, often like hum human error, human emotions, human values uh, get mixed up with technology. It's not always about logics, it's not always about uh, mathematics. Um, and it really shows, you know, you often think of. Um, when, when human error or human values get mixed up with technology, you, you get like biases and all these unexpected problems. Um, but if it's done, like if you're conscious of that fact, if you're conscious about the fact that every piece of technology is imbued with some kind of like human value or human- um, And it's designed by humans. Yeah, if you're conscious of that fact, like it becomes something that you can actually use um, and um, yeah. So we claim that as our totem for thinking about how technology can be designed with humanistic values and very conscious about us as well being situated in this world. That's the name, basically. Uh, super interesting. So I'll, I'll get back to this, this point of values and design. I would first ask a question. Um, I, I will start with you because we're talking now, but maybe the others can also respond um, because everybody has been working in this field already for some time and um, our project um, um, has been like it was a, like officially five years project but now it's a six year six years project and we discussed yesterday how the the context of datafication has changed over the years um, and i wondered how um how you experienced that if you do you experience the like the issues being uh, changing and how do you deal with changing affairs? So I'll start with you and then maybe the others can uh, respond. Uh, I think one thing that's, that's been interesting for us um, is this idea that the, you know, the, the more uh, datafication um, becomes part of uh, our everyday lives, it also becomes a bigger part of public discourse. Um, so, you often see, you know, more and more like Instagram influencers talking about gaming the algorithm or um, people sharing tips on how to trick HR software um, used for screening CVs. Um, I think there is also examples of, for example, the last um, social protests, protests in Colombia where they, they, where they use TikTok to share tips to to fight uh, in the streets and many of the TikToks were about like how to use the beauty filter and this song so the, the algorithm doesn't recognize you. And I think that is important because that is the, con the content that we share in our page and how the project of algorithms of late capitalism started is produced also by users. And I think um, before was uh, uh, we had this tech, tech news that of course uh, after the Cambridge Analytica I started thinking more critically about technology and not only reporting about the latest issues of, of uh, hardware and software. And I think uh, now we also get this beautiful content, the user content created uh, with this critical stance towards uh, algorithms. 
Yeah, so I think for us it's also about like the, the more uh, the world is getting datafied, um, uh, there's also like this, the scouting discourse is happening. And I think it, that's, some, that's something that we, and I, I think all of, uh, we all shared a lot of these works that really um, capitalize on that because uh, the, the visitors to the exhibition or the participants in my workshops also bring their experiences and their knowledge um, and then I think our, our goal is really like to inject that that like little spark um, that that uh, catalyzes that into some kind of a critical reflection. And I think uh, Viola also mentioned this. Sometimes people see this artwork and it suddenly just sparks this reaction. Um, so I think that's that's yeah that's something that's very interesting. It, it becomes part of the public discourse. And then I think uh, it's also the work of artists to just take that and and like uh, put a spark to it. Okay, thanks. What about the others? Do you also recognize this like increasing awareness? And uh, what is not, you know, then, then my, my follow up question would be, then what is not being discussed and maybe should be discussed? Yeah, maybe if <laughs> I take the, the floor on this. So if I think about um, data and the way um, we um, derive uh, knowledge from it. I uh, think of it as something that also existed before the digital, really. So not to be confused. So if we speak about art and data, data activism, um, it's really the data more than the digital that I, that I would consider. But then even so, if you think about um, when data became big data <laughs> with, um, 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 emerging technologies. Um, I think the view of big data was for a long time um, such um, that um, that one would need to be careful maybe not to, to leak or how to manage it or maybe it was burdened by costs to collect that data or um, and the, the shift that I see in, in the last years was um, more, more like towards a few onto big data that, oh, if we regulate it, if we think about how to curtail it, you know, and, and um, not unleash it, um, then it might affect um, the um, outlook of uh, national economies in a negative way because it could potentially curtail innovation, right? So. Mm, like we see this discussion also in relation to, uh, let's say, artificial intelligence and um, and what does it, you know, what can it do? What is the potential? Or oh, let's just not regulate um, because then maybe another country that has a f much freer approach uh, or much radical approach or whatever you want to call it, like China is often being used as a um, kind of outlook, will then overtake um, our European or national economy because they have um, um, unleashed possibilities and don't need to worry about ethical questions or aspects like that. And so, so really where I see a urgent um, task, and I think it's also a task that art can fulfill very well, is to, is to remind ourselves and to remind um, policymakers that um, uh, data is not just this A material um, I don't know, substrate that we just sweat out as we go along our lives. Um, and in that sense, I feel that the word data shadow was um, an attractive but really unlucky choice how to, how to speak about the datafication of ourselves for a long time, because it's really more, you know, the, to remind ourselves that um, yeah, data is an an extension, something that boomerangs back. I mean, really something that opens and closes doors for the real person behind it, you know, for the for the human. So at the end of the day, if we speak about data, we still speak about the human. Um, yeah, and so this is where my arts practice comes in and where I see a lot of interesting art happening. Yoda, what do you think? About? The, um, the changing concerns of the last years. 
I was just actually answering a Q&A uh, question. Oh, you're answering Q&A. <laughs> oh, that's also yeah. okay. Okay, it yeah, was well, also in, in the epic. chat. Yeah. yeah, that's also fine. I, it was also, I, I noticed the question and it was quite interesting because yeah. I was actually, when I was thinking about the design studio, the teapot design studio, and uh, their focus on transformative design, I was also thinking about you know, how does this work on the longer term? And the question in the in the Q and A from uh, Kim Schoenfeld is: um, I love these projects. Thanks for everyone for sharing. I'm wondering, do any of you have any experience in following up what people do with the experience of these art projects slash events? What the reactions are, and whether people feel somehow empowered to do something about their own and general data privacy? So Viola, you were. Uh, typing an answer, but yeah, then you can share answering. it and now it does. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, it was also uh, like I actually said before, this is always difficult to measure eh? because it's always, yeah, how do you measure things? So the only things is what I see is uh, the uh, the signals that I hear back. So the director of, of city marketing in Eindhoven is really mentioning our artworks in press interviews, how he was touched and yeah, what, what he learned from the whistleblowing uh, uh, experience. And even years after, every time I mention it, I see his eyes slowly fading off. So it really touched and sparked like, uh, like um, the other people said, really uh, heavily deep in his heart. And the people of, of the high-tech campus, which call, call themselves the, the smartest square kilometer of the Netherlands, uh, they incorporated monsters in their talks and practice and their advices, but they found out that time was an issue there. So I like to self-reflect, but then if they still... So it's it's really interesting to like first sparkle people, then that they incorporate, and then they they find out this conflict. Like the reason that we're probably using Zoom now and not Yitzi is probably because there was, um, yeah, it might have been more difficult to uh, do this with Yitzi. Yeah, maybe you should ma clarify what Yitzi is. Oh yeah, Yitzi is like, like the privacy friendly version of Zoom. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, so there does, so you always need a dialogue to, to understand each other better. And that is actually a continuous uh, uh, process that you have, have to have uh, yeah, with the audience or with each other. And it's also very, uh, yeah, you can learn a lot from it. And it is also very customized if you dialogue all the time with each other. Because you're part, part of this big ecosystem and you have a possible trap that you only st stay in your own bubble. Eh? Because in the beginning, I found out that most of our visitors were art fans or they uh, read the same newspapers as we did. So I thought, shit, that's not uh, all the people in the world. <laughs> How do I reach those people? So that was really a thing that I worked on for years to try to find it out. And I was testing it a lot with my neighbors and uh, with my friends that were not into tech at all. So, yeah. So, well, Carla and uh, Adrian, do you uh, follow up? Um, after with your the, the participants that participated in the these workshops that you organized. Well, we we have um, a Tumblr and an Instagram page where, of course, people can share us their meme themes and things like that. But I think I well, I wanted to mention this um, event for that we recently participated, the Mozilla Fest where uh, you can see like a sense of community where people do do realize uh, things like for example in one of our workshops one one person did said um, like i didn't know this exists i'm very happy that i got into here just because of memes and then and i think like uh, of course there are uh, bigger platforms for them to to join and that's i think uh, part of our premise as well like Yes, uh, be a stepping stone of people to discover many things like, for example, Ars Electronica or Mozilla Fest or many uh, digital feminism in organizing in Berlin. Um, and think even the, the, also the, the projects that Viola um, the curated, I think our, our approach is more like be that the stepping stone of people into their people's phones and say, ah, this is funny and then like, be yes, a snowball. Yeah, and I think uh, now and again we hear from people who've, who've, who've joined our workshops. So we don't actively follow up on them, but they do kind of like become um, a little bit part of like our 
our network so uh, we have people who, who, who might join again and then we, we kind of continue the conversation but I think the nice thing is also the, the discussions that happen within the context of the workshop and there you often hear uh, people um, I don't know, especially um, it's, it's not that we try to kind of educate people or anything like that, but it's usually in the context of the discussion between different people, like they, they do seem to, um, I don't know, discover like some interesting new angles and interesting new ideas. Um, and I think that's really what, what um, makes it worth doing. Um, as, as far as changing their, um, their habits and their their, uh, I don't know, data privacy settings and things like that, you can always hope, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's in any case something that we all struggle with. And I think this, this uh, step of just being more um, reflexive or more critical or more aware um, is really the first step. Oh, thanks. Um, I, um, there's no questions at the moment in the Q&A, so I'll, I'll move on with the question that I had um, about Manu's work. So Manu, at the end of your presentation, you were talking about, if I got you right, institutions, uh, art collections and alternative approaches to the concept of what is an art collection. And, um, but you also, um, you're also involved with uh, the field of human rights, which is again, a, a, like a field that we usually maybe don't associate with art practices and within our project we've been talking to people that are involved with data investigations human rights issues um, in relation to to data and they and, and datafication and surveillance and um, my, my question to you is what artistic approaches can contribute to that field of um, of human rights and especially human rights investigations So, you know, when you say when you say human rights, um, uh, I feel that f through the last uh, I don't know I don't want to sound old, but <laughs> decades, um, this yeah this notion has um, uh, this, this uh, term of human rights has really um, reduced its. Um, it's a shining power. I mean, I feel that many people um, don't understand how much their own lives relate to the points that human rights um, try to encompass and to, and to bring together or how their own struggle, even, you know, struggle within a uh, democratic setting relates to human rights. Um, it's really become mm, a notion that has become associated with um, torch and dictatorships or, or these kind of um, um, uh, peak violence events. Um, so, yeah, so it was um, interesting for me to see um, while, you know, while, while being uh, concerned about the increased use of, um, um, how should you say, surveillance um, through technologies that, that are being, you know, disguised as gadgets or <laughs> playful devices um, um, how in in that field that openly um, commits to this idea of, of um, uh, continuing the battle for human rights um, has picked up on techniques um, like looking into uh, research methods um, uh, that allow for um, various data layers to be, you know, ex explore, penetrated, to patch together a, a picture um, from more diverse, diverse uh, sources, data sources. Um, so if you describe a, a situation where um, abuse of human rights um, has taken place there will always be gaps in the in the description and then that's often where opinion or ideology um, uh, fills the gaps and and so with this more if you like um, forensic approach and using all the possibilities of um, researching data um, 
on the internet, um, user data, also, you know, um, um, through the use of those techniques, um, it's, it's possible to, to create a picture that is maybe more informed through, um, yeah, I don't want to say neutral information, but, but let's say a diversity, a diversity of information sources. Um, and so um, there are groups like um, uh, Bellingcat, they work more like in a, in a journalistic field or, or forensic architecture, Syrian archive. Um, um, they do some really interesting work as in that they try to exploit all the different ways that um, we can access without, you know, without um, tapping into enormous resources. Um, it's more like a, a question of skill than of, um, than of high tech. Um, yeah, in order to patch together um, in an, an issue or a situation. And so, well, in my own practice, um, I mean, uh, yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm very interested in these different layers that um, the, the digital world um, um, presents um, um, quite often with a, with a glossy, shiny surface or user interface. And so some of my work, for example, looked more at the legal realities, the, the legal attributes um, that define a digital image or, or, or image data or my current project, which looks at the um, um, Sorry, the can, you, uh, can you clarify what that uh, means? Yes, yeah, maybe I should stick with one example. And, and yeah, um, because there's um, a comment also in the Q&A, art is visual storytelling, visual philosophy. And I think you're now explaining, you know, you're explaining something about legal criteria and what becomes an image. So could you maybe... Yes. Clarif so, clarify what, what you mean. <laughs> um, so uh, I was uh, quite um, uh, puzzled and disturbed by the fact that uh, London's streets were at a very early stage um, surveyed 24 hours, seven days um, a week by uh, surveillance cameras, not just the streets, but every fish and chip shop really, you know, it's like um, um, a way of life here. <laughs> and um, um, so I became quite interested as a, you know, citizen in a democratic country. So what are, what are my rights um, in relation to this uh, security concept? Mm -hmm. And um, so I discovered that uh, under data protection, I, as the data subject, I have the right to know which data is being collected, um, so which data is being held in a systematic manner. And computers are holding data, they are filing data in a systematic manner. So CCTV images are being time-coded and filed systematically. So I wrote letters to um, operators of CCTV systems uh, claiming copies of my image data, referring to the um, data protection that um, uh, should be employed in a, in a quite comparable way across the whole of Europe that was um, introduced as part of uh, EU-wide um, legislation. And um, it turned out that not only do I have a right to these images, um, so that means um, uh, that, you know, as long as I'm the data subject, I can get these these copies, but also other legal uh, properties of the image define what I will hand, hold in my hands at the end. Uh, so for example, the right to privacy, which of course is formulated in the Human Rights Act um, that um, gives uh, third parties in the image or in the document, it doesn't have to be an image, the right not to be identifiable. So their names or in the case of image data, it's the uh, faces or figures have to be made unrecognizable, which is often, most often being done by blacking them out. Mm. So at the end, I would hold an image in my hand where I am visible, maybe the surroundings are visible, but all other passerbys have blacked out faces. Um, um, so there were 
if you know a few attributes like this for example what is a cctv camera uh, which um, part of public space is it allowed uh, to frame uh, or um, which for which purpose is it allowed to be installed so there are quite a few um, yeah legal definitions that define the angle or the um, or even the lifespan of this image. Hmm? And so I continued um, to, them, to request these images um, and uh, called the, um, the work that I created with these images a legal ready-made because so much of the visual identity of this image was not defined by me, the artist, but by the legal realities around that image. So in reference to, um, to the, to the uh, to Shams, if you like, ready-made, um, I called it a legal ready-made. Mm. So of course, having said that, um, it turned out that it was a case of art really investigating law and the, uh, you know, if, yeah, how, how good is this piece of legislation? And it turned out um, that only 8% of my, you know, hundreds of letters over a period of five years um, would result in, uh, po you know, in positive, um, correctly handled um, responses. The other 92% um, um, turned out to be complete failures um, in compliance, uh, you know, either the data um, uh, handlers um, made mistakes and lost the data, or they would send the data without uh, um, uh, protecting the privacy of other people, or um, they would say the system hasn't actually worked, or, I mean, yeah, it's a long story, and the analysis is, um, has also been published um, uh, online and allowed me to enter a very interdisciplinary discourse with this kind of finding and um i find yeah, it so super fascinating <laughs> so the, the one of the comments was art is visual storytelling visual philosophy but this is also philosophy of technology right and data it's 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 very interesting i'm i'm, I'm gonna read it <laughs> the, the 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 text um i'm going to um, move on um sort of zoom out again and uh, I, I just want to point that if people still have questions, please put them in the Q&A because we don't have that much time left. Um, uh, Viola, uh, you, um, you, you talked, uh, through, during your presentation, you talked about the, all these different publics. And so you have the larger public that visits um, the manifestation events. You also have smaller audiences, which might be also the companies that sponsor you and uh, some stakeholders that, that you are, you know, working in a high tech uh, city. Uh, how do you, how do you translate critique to these different uh, audiences? So how do you, you know, how do you strategically maneuver yourself through those different publics? Well, we also have uh, uh, refugees and refugee kids and blinds and, and really old people. So that is, uh, yeah, <laughs> as broad as possible. But can you please uh, define what you mean with the word critique? Critique. So I think some of the projects that you show, they are actually quite critical about um, datafication or the possible impacts of surveillance Although I know you also explore, uh, let's say, the empowering effects mm -hmm. of data and technology, yeah. um, but I can imagine that you have, you know, there it's a very broad audience, so you have to speak different vocabularies. Languages. Oh yeah, Languages, that is yeah. a good uh, question. Well, I once learned that uh, someone told me if you put a really spectacular artwork at the entrance, then everybody will come in. So what I did is always have like one or two really spectacular things, like this big uh, robot uh, that you could um, move yeah, as a visitor when you were wearing an, an exoskeleton, like a suit. And it was so cool because if you would stick out your arm, it would be like you would be boxing with a giant steel uh, ro robot. 
And when you do this, you don't only do this for two seconds because you keep touching your own nose or, or, or other things. And then you think, wow, could, could this be like the army of the future? And it is such a simple artwork and so spectacular and with such high impact that it automatically uh, yeah, gives a lot of questions to the people. Eh? So they think, hey, but is this the kind of uh, army future that we want? And um, is it cool or is it not cool? Wait a minute. So it, it, it has actually maybe also all the elements of a, of a science fiction movie. So on one hand, it is cool. But on the other hand, I use the spectacular artworks also to get... Um, people uh, step by step into deeper layers. Eh? Some of the artworks um, are a little bit deeper than other ones. And um, some of them appeal more to one target audience than the other ones, like some of the artworks cannot be seen by the blind, but then I try to have them still have, have a good experience there by touching or smelling or uh, feeling like spanning. <laughs> and, um, uh, and this multi-sensor, multi-sensorial experience also yeah or interactive experience gives people a higher chance of taking it in but uh, i always try to program uh, our exhibitions are like three to six thousand square meters in a way that both the mother gets touched and the kids and the grandma and the father and the geeks so um yeah i really use this this multi-language thing but always with a couple of criteria and one of them was the the headline that i mentioned in the beginning eh? like the internet movie database one line description that you don't need to puzzle you don't get tired you don't get bored but they show yeah a lot of people say oh, yeah, oh we get a lot of energy from this exhibition and often with an exhibition we see maybe one good artworks but here we saw at least five that uh, we still remember after a year and, uh, and I think, wow, yeah, that is, uh, that is uh, how you do it. Often in art, as a curator, you only have one topic and then you search like a couple of things with it, but it makes sense. But then you don't reach everybody. So I try to have this whole Gesamtkunstwerk where I have uh, all these people touched as many as possible and it's hard and activating them like, hey, it's time to uh, send a mail to the president today <laughs> or to do something about this, get the power back into your hands. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just thinking about because you talk about headline, <laughs> short sentences. So I'm going to ask all of you for like one short sentence. And, um, and that is if you would like look forward and uh, think about the the challenges or the concerns or the the problems or maybe the beautiful things that um uh, datafication will bring um what kind of methods are needed so if you you know if if you would teach at an art school or maybe you do already or maybe you don't like art schools i don't know but if you were you know if you if you could give a message to um people exploring artistic approaches to datafication in the coming years, what would you tell them to do? Um, the, uh, Carla and uh, Adrian. Yeah. Um, in one sentence, um, I don't know, for me personally, it's, it's also this thing of not to be intimidated uh, to really get the hands on of the technology or the te technical things. Um, because I think it's a lot of times coming from the arts or humanities, there's this distance where you just want to theorize about it. Um, and I think it's, yeah, just to kind of like break down those barriers. And I think for me, it's uh, as well thinking of um, art and everything as post-digital as well, right? Like we are entering a, um, a phase where new media or digital media is not anymore new. So, and many things are mediated to, to software. So I think uh, understanding what a uh, post-digital is and all the aesthetics that bring with uh, post-digital, I think it's very nice to also think about that. Thanks, Manu. Oops, unmute. <laughs> um, so yeah, what would my <laughs> advice be? Well, at the one hand, take your time to become data literate. But on the other hand, mm, I recommend really, especially to young people, children, mm, you know, develop your sense for values. 
also as much as you can in, in, in the real space, real life, um, in the non-digital space. Mm, um, yeah, I just feel whatever experience we have there um, um, and, 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 and it also encounters, I mean, and those kind of analog skills, um, they, yeah, they're quite anchoring, you know, they, they will always be there as an inner compass when we then um, enter this borderless, beautifully endless world <laughs> um, um, of, um, yeah, the kind of uh, cyberspace of virtual reality. Mm, but also, you know, never, never stop dreaming, never stop blue sky thinking. Um, don't be scared of, um, of dreams um, and, and, and thinking they're not feasible. And then also always remember what it is you actually can do. You know, you don't need to wait for years and years until you can afford a project, a big camera or, or um, powerful computer. There's so much you can already do. And I um, also really like um, um, Carla and Adrian's like your approach, you know, to create a game that is actually an object that brings people together and, and that, um, yeah, brings these questions, these challenges that we experience um, um, in the data fed world back again to um, a table over a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And Viola, what is your uh, headline for the future? Yeah, make it easy to understand. I always said for one minute rule, if people don't understand it within one minute, well, with my exhibitions, they're always gone. I uh, miss them. So then they're distracted and they're off again. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to take one minute to close. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you very much to all the speakers for joining us and, um, and giving new insights. And there were surely like a lot of things that I'm going to look into and think about. Um, I also want to thank um, SPY25 uh, for hosting uh, this event. I want to thank the Data Active team um, for, um, well, <laughs> being there, being here and uh, contributing to the project and also uh, to uh, the workshop of yesterday and today. I want to thank especially the principal investigator, which is Stefania Milan. And um, uh, finally, I want to thank the European Research Council for funding our research project. And um, lastly, uh, uh, Aska, uh, the research school and the Department of Media Studies for hosting our project. And um, yes, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed the event as much as I did. And um, I think uh, we can now say goodbye to everybody. <laughs>